Chris, if we want to look at the universe, the all existence, mm -hmm. and look for its, its fundamental features, you see order and disorder, mm -hmm. things that look like they must happen, mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. that are utterly random mm -hmm. or chance. Mm -hmm. How do these poles help us to understand what reality is? You're a scientist mm -hmm. and a theologian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do each of those allow you to understand this mixture of complexities? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the order is what one tends to focus on in the sciences, you know, and certainly as an ex-astrophysicist, I have a very strong sense of the way in which the whole process of the universe after the Big Bang sort of unfolded in this extraordinary way which led ultimately to the formation of stars, the formation of planets, the formation of at least one planet, many, may, maybe many more, on which the conditions were right for complex molecules to evolve, um, and ultimately life forms, and ultimately, you know, intelligent self-conscious life forms like ourselves. At the same time, I'm aware that when one looks particularly at that the later processes um, that I've just described, you know, the evolution of human beings, then clearly the universe didn't have to go exactly in the direction it did. Um, people like Stephen Jay Gould, as a biologist, for example, have, as you know, have very much said, look, you know, we could have been wiped out by an asteroid at an early stage. There's no particular reason why things should have got exactly to where they've got now. Um, on the other hand, there have been other biologists, and even somebody like Richard Dawkins would acknowledge this partially, who, who say that even when you allow for all those random things that could have happened, there's still a sort of predictability in the evolutionary process. Um, Simon Conway Morris, in particular, has talked about evolutionary convergence, the way in which, in practice, if there's a particular adaptation that will work in a particular ecological niche, then in practice, from very different starting points, you will find sort of evolutionary lines that tend to converge on that particular adaptation. And you can think of things like the way in which certain mammals in the sea, for example, look like look quite like fish, even though they've actually started from a very, very different point of view. Now that to me is actually quite important because I do want to acknowledge both the necessity, you know, the laws of nature, and also those chance things. But it seems to me that if God intended something like us, then yeah, sure, it may not have happened in the way that it happens to on this planet in the particular way that it has. But the chances of it happening pretty much with you know, this sort of endpoint sooner or later is in fact not negligible. In fact, somebody like Simon Conway Morris would tend to argue that it must have happened many times and that certainly if, um, if we are ever to you know, make contact with extraterrestrials, they will have lots of features in common with us simply because that's the way the evolutionary process works. If there were to be uh, sentient, intelligent mm. aliens, mm. would that uh, be neutral for your theology, mm. help it? or uh, degrade it? For myself, I think it would be very interesting to see, if we ever did make that sort of contact, whether in fact the same sort of aesthetic and religious frameworks that we have had evolved elsewhere. That would actually sort of very much help my point of view. On the other hand, it would challenge it, not in a destructive way, but in a very constructive way, I think, because a lot of Christian theology in particular has a very strong sense of the incarnation in focusing on one particular human being on one planet. It also has a very strong sense of what it is to be human made in the image of God. And if there were other you know, near humans, what would that say about that? I think it would actually modify the way in which we thought about both of those things. Mm. But as I say, I think that could happen in a very constructive way rather than a destructive way. But it would certainly mean, as so often happens, that we would have to modify our theology or go deeper into our own theology in order to understand it properly. But, you know, that's the way science works. Science is always progressing. Why shouldn't theology? Well, that's a fundamental mm. point. And as you look at the order and disorder in the universe mm. and you see in theology, a willingness to adapt itself mm. as science must adapt mm. itself. Mm. That's a new view of theology mm. that, frankly, uh, very few theologians mm. and perhaps even fewer believers mm. are willing to accept. Mm. I think more theologians would accept that than you might recognize. I do agree there is a tendency among some believers, at least, to simply say that, you know, what was good enough for my great-grandfather or even more generations back from that is good enough for me. But in practice, if you look at the way that theology 
has actually developed over many centuries, you will find, you know, there are differences of emphasis. Um, there are changes that happen. And the important thing is that those changes aren't always simple novelties. What sometimes happens, and I think this is what would happen under the circumstances we've been talking about, is that in fact people would look much more deeply into the tradition they've inherited and actually find things there that would be helpful to them that they're perhaps not even aware of now. So at one level, I'm very conservative in theology. You know, all that I've said may suggest that I'm a sort of wild radical and the average believer wouldn't sort of uh, be happy with me at all. But my instinct always as a theologian is to say, okay, not simply what does this force me now to do in terms of changing my theology, but what resources does the theological tradition within which I'm working, what resources exist already which might help me to sort of unpack this new issue that's arisen? Um, so in a sense, I'm a wild radical. At another level, I'm actually quite a deep conservative, but it's a sort of deep conservatism which I agree some, some apparently conservative believers wouldn't be very happy with.